No one is talking to moms about the challenges of sex. No one's talking to moms about how to make that better with toys, with content, with whatever. Because the reality is we're not going to roll up to the love boutique off the freeway in our SUVs with our school stickers on it. Like most moms are not going to do that, but it doesn't mean that we don't deserve mind blowing sex. So where do you go for recommendation? Where do you go for that? You're listening to the MILF podcast. This is the show where we talk about motherhood and sexuality with amazing women with fascinating stories to share on the joys of being a MILF. Now here's your host, the milfiest MILF I know, Jennifer Tracy. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. This is MILF Podcast, the show where we talk about motherhood, sexuality, entrepreneurship. And today on the show, we have Brooke Christian of Flirty Girl Guide. Brooke came to me through Instagram. I'm so glad she did because we had such a great conversation. I'm just going to tease you a little bit and say that her her business... She's, she's an entrepreneur. She's brilliant and beautiful and sexy and funny and warm and wonderful. And her business is a little bit sexy. It's a little bit milfy. It's a little bit milfy. It's actually a lot milfy, you guys. So we're going to get into this. And um, thanks for tuning in. And I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Hi, Brooke. Hi. I'm so excited to be here. Oh my God, I'm so excited to have you. So your full name is Brooke Christian, right? Yes. And I'm Jewish, which is so weird. Ah! Like it's the weirdest <laughs> oh my God, thing. I ever. love it. That is hysterical. Yeah. I don't understand. We named my son a Hebrew name just to Oh, what's his name? Natan, just to make him like super Jewy to con- to counter it. <laughs> I love it. Oh my God, I love it so much. And your husband is Jewish also? He is. So his dad was born Catholic and then converted when he met my mother-in-law. My husband was raised Jewish. It's just he has a last name that says Christian. So welcome to America. Yep. That's right. That's right. Um, So as Brooke and I were discussing before, just before we hit record and figured out the technical stuff, um, she said, so I can say cock on your show, right? (laughs) And I'm like, (laughs) yes. You could say cock, you could say clit, you can say uterus, vagina, you can even say pussy. Uh, all we welcome all. Thank goodness, because it's hard to have a conversation about sex when you can't say those words. So, yay! So, and you were you were sharing with me that you your business started from a cock ring, which I didn't know. So, yeah. tell me tell me about that. I started this business, which is really a platform for moms to talk about sex. Um, and how hard it is with motherhood. And basically what happened is I am a severe PPD survivor. With my son, I was slayed and suicidal and it was Mm. horrible. And part of my recovery, Mm. in addition to therapy and drugs and all this stuff, was sort of getting my life back together. And for me, that meant putting my body in another visual space. Like I wanted to look good. I wanted to lose my weight. I'm careful about how I say that because I don't want women to think that that's necessary. But for me, emotionally, that meant something and I needed that. So once I got to a really good place, I just kind of randomly decided to do a boudoir photo shoot for my husband, which if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's this very like sensual, gorgeous photo shoot that you do in like lingerie splayed on a bed. But yes. um, oh it, my God, that's so my jam. I love that. Um, have you ever done one? I've done many of I yes. Right. I was a, a burlesque dancer for years, a belly dancer for years, and then I now currently do pole dancing. And so I've had I yeah. Is finding your erotic self post oh. um yeah, you must come to a class with me. You're you're going I, to come to a class. I'm such a I it's made am for you. a pole dancing fanatic. And we can talk about that in a minute, but I oh, so I am obsessed with pole dancing. Okay, great. So we have to do it together then. Yes. Yeah. When I'm in so LA, yes, I'm very and and I lo- I'm so online and aligned with what your message is and what you're doing and you know it's so similar to my path of like coming out of PPD and reclaiming myself and and pole finding pole dancing was part of that for me. So okay, so you had this sexy beautiful boudoir for your husband initially. 
even though it probably got gave more to you than it did for him. <laughs> I was uh, just about to say that everyone goes into boudoirs thinking yeah. that it's for their partner and it really is for them. And I very much on that shoot had a Phoenix r- sort of rising moment where I realized, oh my mm. God, I am a sexy mama. And that was so empowering. I, I just had this moment of like, I am a feminine goddess. Oh my God. And motherhood really robbed that from me. You know, I, I hadn't had that feeling yeah. in five years. Yeah. And so um, I went home that night and had like the craziest sex with my husband ever because I felt so empowered. We didn't use the cock ring that night, actually. But what it did is that it opened up this <laughs> whole, I know, this whole sort of side of myself. And I started being a yeah. little bit more adventurous in bed. And so uh, my husband actually found the cock ring, God bless him, that he would be bold enough to walk <laughs> into the pleasure chest in the West Village and buy that. But he did. And we used it. And like I always enjoyed sex. But I would say that this cock ring, which I now sell, ad nauseum, is sex before the cock ring was like analog television with like the wires coming out of the top, right? (laughs) And sex (laughs) after the cock ring was like 4D IMAX. And I looked at him and I was like, please don't take this the wrong way. But holy crap, (laughs) like that is what sex is? <gasps> wow. And so what happened was is I started wow. telling my girlfriends, right? Like my contemporaries, other moms at, you know, the Jimboree class. I was like, do you know about this thing? <laughs> and I was like, are you aware? I love it. And they were all like, no. And I was like, you got to go on Amazon and buy this. I am telling you, you have to do it. And they all did because, yeah. I mean, let's be real. When your friend recommends something, you're more apt to buy it. It's just how women work, right? trust each other. And absolutely, ev- especially when it comes from another mom. Well, right. So this was the secret I realized. Okay. So all of these moms bought it. All of these moms came back to me and were like, yeah, you know, it's unreal. <laughs> and now we're having sex all the time because it's so good. Yeah. And I was like, Ding, 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 ding. There's an unserved market here. No one is talking to moms about the challenges of sex. No one's talking to moms about how to make that better with toys, with content, with whatever. Because the reality is we're not going to roll up to the love boutique off the freeway in our SUVs with our school stickers on it. Like most moms are not going to do that, but it doesn't mean that we don't deserve mind blowing sex. So where do you go for recommendation? Where do you go for that? And I realized nowhere. And I just felt well, I can do this. I have a magazine background. I ran marketing for all the big women's magazines in New York. And I just thought, I worked for Oprah for a million years. And I just thought, I, I know how to talk to women. I can do this. Um, so that's how it started. And it, it did kind of start with a cock ring, believe it or not. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So Brooke, can you explain to our listeners who may not have had experience with what a cock ring is? Like what is it what does it look like? What does it do? And how does it enhance the pleasure for both? Sure. Parties? So a cock ring is a, a, a ring, like a, a circular silicone ring that goes on the shaft of the penis. Okay. It goes all the way down to the base. Now, the one that I love and that was life changing has kind of like an oval head on the top of it that vibrates right? It's a vibrator on top. And so what it does is his shaft becomes a vibrating Anna, for lack of a better term. And your clit is being vibed every time you guys are moving together, which is kind of a beautiful experience because you have to do it together, you know, and it, it can be, it's really bonding and it can be really intimate. And I always like to say that men don't know that they like vibrators on their dicks until they try it. And then they are like, oh my God, <laughs> which is sort of crazy because we all know what a Hummer is. You know, like all guys yeah. know what a Hummer is. So like, why wouldn't you do yeah. that during sex? So 
that's what it is. And I love it because it has to be a shared experience. And, you know, I talk to moms and most of them, not all of them are in relationships or dating or what have you. And it's nice to have those moments together, you know? Um, and that's what I love about it so much. The other benefit for men and, and how I sort of convince them to do this is it has a Viagra effect for them because it, the ring actually constricts the blood flow to their cock. So, so they stay, they hard, stay hard longer. longer and they basically are like, I Got feel it. like men, you know, like I am <laughs> men. And so that yes. they like also, cause we all know men are fragile. Yes. So that feeds their erotic creature and their sexual desire and, and the masculinity of it. And I, and I love that. Wow. That's so Fascinating. So you started this. How long ago was this? How old were your children? So you said Jimboree class. So like they must have been little. My daughter was probably five and my son was okay. like 18 months. I mean, he was young. Um, I got a lot of flack when I started this business because I'm a mom of young kids. I live in a very suburban Interesting. Um, New York community. And while it's not uptight, it's a liberal community. There are no moms who are in the sex business unless they're porn stars, which is fine, but it's not mainstream. Yeah. And I, uh, I just sort of truck on through that. I keep my children very private. I do not post them on yeah. social media. I do not talk about them in um, my work as Flirty Girl. My husband and I are very protective of them. And, you know, the best way... I describe it to my daughter. I don't think my son gets it even still at five, but he just knows mommy works. Um, he'll be horrified when he gets to high school, but that's a while away. <laughs> um, I should reach out to like Pamela Anderson's son and be like, how'd that go for you? But the way I explain it to my daughter is... Well, although, I mean, no deference to Pam, who's amazing. I love Pam, but like, you it sounds like you have really way healthier boundaries currently yes. in your life. Yes. Just generally and, speaking. And I'm not flagrant about my body, right? Like I'm I'm a content provider. I'm a concierge yes. for women's sex lives. I'm not yes. have vagina splayed out all over the place. So I mean it's different. Yeah. But the way I describe yeah. it to my daughter, who's very attuned to me in the world, she's kind of an old soul, is that I make other mommies feel really beautiful and I make mommies and daddies love each other more. Mm. And sort of when you explain things to children, you really base... You realize what it actually yeah, is. Yeah, you, you can totally. sort of simplify it to its core. Yeah. And that I really do see that as what I do. I really do. Yeah, that's so beautiful. That's so amazing. So I want to I want to ask you specifically like what kind of flack were you getting do you still get like is it from family from close friends like what does that look like My family was very supportive they I the conversation I had with my parents when I presented to them I like <laughs> had a powerpoint for my dad I had like no. graphs I had like you know, data on the sex industry. Like I came at oh it my from God, a I love very it. like business school standpoint because I wanted to make him feel like this wasn't salacious. You know, I wanted him to feel like this was something valuable in the world. And that worked. That was smart psychology on my end. They're super supportive. My mom literally reads every single thing I write and goes to every single speaking engagement. And that's horrifying Aww. for me, but she's, really <laughs> awesome. I always warn her. I'm like, mom, I'm going to talk about blowjobs. I just want you to know. And she's like, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> we all do them. I'm like, please stop. Talking. She said not. Yeah. She said we all oh, do yeah. them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm like, please stop. I love her. Right now. <laughs> I love yeah. her. We oh, call my God. her the OG flirty girl. Like she's the original. Yes. Sure. Yes. Um, yes. So my family was very supportive. Um, what I found was that I started to lose acquaintances, right? Like uh, I started to get asked on less play dates. Some women or some moms were okay with my kids playing at their house, but not playing at my house. 
I have wow. the sense that they thought there were sex toys like on the kitchen table on the something. counter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Which is funny. Really weird because the sex toys I actually recommend don't look anything like sex toys. Like they look like pieces of jewelry or paperweights or air thermometers. Like they don't look anything like a dildo. I don't even sell dildos. Like that's just Yeah. Most women have a penis already in their lives. I don't need to send, sell them another one. Like that's just yeah. not how we need to be. Yeah. But so that's that's what I saw starting to happen. That's tapered off a bit. But you know what? I saw it as a good editing tool, quite frankly. Like if you weren't cool with this, then you weren't my people, you know? And um, the way I see it manifest the most now that my children are older, uh, my daughter's in third grade, and my son's in kindergarten. My daughter's really into sports. And, you know, our weekends are taken up on the fields. And I'm in that little, like, folding chair, you know, with, like, my coffee and the cup holder and my baseball hat, you know. And um, no no moms will sit with me. Really? Yeah, I, I sit by myself. And I noticed that this year in particular, they also sort of, sort of huddle together on the picnic tables or whatever. And... And I know they talk about me. You can hear the whispering when I show up. Um, and that's fine. I, I, that's fine. I, I don't care. I mean, look, if I cared about what other people thought, I wouldn't ever be doing this. Like, if you have thin skin, you can't do this. So that's fine. Uh, but the irony to me and the part I can't really figure out is that I'm just there to help them. Like, those are the exact women I'm here helping. You know, it's just, I think it's an insecurity thing. I think it demonstrates all the things that they really need help with that I can really help them with. Um, but that's okay. If they're not ready for me, if they're not ready for the message, that's okay. That's okay. No one's mean. Um, and if anyone came at me being mean, watch, watch out. I'm an Aries. You, you, you better watch out. But <laughs> don't mess with the ram. That's how I notice it mostly now. Interesting. That's yeah. so interesting. Well, I mean, I can sort of relate to that because when I started the pole dancing, it's funny because I of of mom friend from preschool was the one who introduced me to it. You know, she is still one of my dearest friends and you would never know, you know, just based on seeing her at preschool and she's incredibly just like us, just a normal mom walking around, beautiful, physically beautiful, but like I went to this dance class with her and I didn't know what to expect. And I watched her move. She would dance for us at the end of the class to like demo. I was like, not sure that I wasn't gay at that moment because I was so like turned on and just blown away. And I realized like, Oh my God, like I want what she has. I want to experience that. And so I started on this journey and it's like a year long journey at S factor where I, Pole Sheila Kelly, small. Sheila Kelly is like I, Kelly. is a I, my idol. I mean, I will just yes. bow down to her at any moment. Well, you're doing the same thing for women. I mean, this is this is so profound and powerful. And when we've been taught for so, I mean, particularly, I think every generation, but hopefully, it's changing a little bit now. But it's like don't have sex, don't have sex, but do have sex with that person and don't be slutty and, you know, be sexy, but not too sexy. It's like, what the fuck? How am I supposed to even, I mean, <laughs> you know, so of course people are going to shy away from a woman, you know, who's, who's a mom, because there is this sort of taboo thing about like, oh, you can't be a mom and be sexy. And it's like, why? I actually feel so much more aligned with my sexuality than I ever did before I had a kid because I'm now older and I've been through this life experience and I had postpartum depression. And I think whether you did or not have postpartum depression, it's like, you just don't care anymore about what sexy is to someone else, to the male gaze, or if you're, you know, whatever your sexuality is to the other person's gaze, it's more about experiencing feeling sexy from the inside out and enjoying sex. Like you're saying, like everyone should have the opportunity to really thoroughly enjoy sex and have good sex. We're not dead. 
<laughs> no. So here's what I say about all those things. Cause I, I mean, now I'm going to talk for 10 minutes. You just said so many yes, things go. that are like spot on. So here's my take on all of that is that the fact that no one acknowledges that moms are still women are, is crazy to me. And it's so harmful to our souls, our bodies, our minds, and frankly, to our parenting to say that we are not allowed to be sexy once we have a child. Um, because what winds up happening is we have these massive identity crises. And the truth is having a piece of your life that is just yours is really important to mental health. Whether you're a PPD survivor, whether you're on Zoloft or Prozac, it doesn't matter. You know, we were created to have sex. It's part of our biology and our chemistry. And I just think it's the crappiest thing to say that we are not allowed to tap into that just because we're moms. And so I believe that you can be sexy and a mother. They are not mutually exclusive. But you can't really be them at the same time, right? Like you can't really feel your sexiest when you're like cleaning throw up and poop and like, <laughs> you know, whatever. A parent teacher conferences or your therapist because your kids got issues or whatever. Like those are not your moments. But you you do have to carve out moments when they're not around and when they are asleep. And then it's 15 minutes. And so I think that that's really important. I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to talk about it and I wanted to provide solutions for it. Um, I thought that was really important. And the truth is about sex, like what you said about we should be enjoying it. Sorry, is my dogs. <laughs> moms in particular, that's fine. Moms in particular, as a as a segment, we put up with so much stuff we hate all day long. Like we get touched in ways we don't want to be touched by our kids. We are annoyed. We have to do things we don't want to do, like all day long. Sex is the last place where we should be doing something we don't want to do, right? Or feel like it's ob you know, an obligation. And that's the worst for moms, I think, is that we all inherently know that having sex with our partners is beneficial to our relationships. Like we know that we do, but getting off the couch on a Wednesday night to go upstairs and actually have sex, that's the moment. That's the tough moment, right? When you've been touched out all day and you've been, you know, doing all the things you don't want to do and you just want to sit on the couch and watch Bravo or The Bachelor and he comes over to you and does that like wink, wink, nudge, nudge thing. And you're like, God damn it. You know? And, and so if you're going to get off the couch, which we sort of all know that we should do, then it better blow your mind. Like I am so done with mediocre sex. We deal with mediocrity as moms all day. I am not down with ha having mediocre sex. Like hell no. And the problem for moms is that we don't, well, number one, we don't put our needs first, right? Like we just don't. And number two is a lot of the mom market doesn't know what will turn them on or how to have great sex because we're bored in bed. And frankly, it's really hard for women to orgasm. It is 70% of women need clitoral stimulation in order to orgasm. That is a lot of women. And our hands, you know, after 20 years of using your little finger, it's annoying. Like we want something else, you know? Um, and we don't know where to go for that. So I thought there's an opportunity there. Like we, we should have, you know, tools, we literal tools. Absolutely. Like, and there's so much out there. Yeah. There's so much available. There is, and not, but that's part of the problem, right? Is that there is so much out there. Like if you were to go to adamandeve.com, you would type in clitoral vibrator and you would get 25,000 products wow. that would show up. Yeah. How, How do you choose? How do you know what yeah. to use? Right. So I call it down, right? Like one of the things I do is I sort of curate the best 20 of the 30 toys that I think serve moms well. And what I look for is beauty. Like, can you be proud to own it? And if it was on your nightstand table, would that be okay? Um, is it efficient? 
because let's all be honest, we do not have like two hours to oh, make God. love. <laughs> and, like, I mean, I don't like even want to do that. I actually hate the term make love. It makes me cringe. Like I just, ew. Um, I hate that term. So we don't have that. We have 15 minutes, half hour if we're lucky, if no one's banging on the door with a bad dream or like something like that. So I'm sorry, but we have to get off quickly. Like we just do. So it's got to be efficient, right? And it's got to, I am not concerned with his orgasm. I'm really not. Because 99% of the time, he's always going to have one. So lucky him. I'm concerned with yours. You know, I'm concerned that you're walking out of that experience feeling relaxed and fulfilled and get your serotonin boost boost and all of that. And, you know, the other thing that you mentioned in the pole dancing, and I, I pole dance also, and it is much like a boudoir shoot. It is probably one of the only things that can turn your sexuality on internally. Like you start to see yourself as the sexual being that you didn't even know existed um, in such a deep and that stays with you, right? And the reason why it stays with you is because sexuality and sexiness is nothing more than confidence. It has nothing to do with boobs and ass and heels. It is about how comfortable you are in your skin and who you are as a person, right? That is all it is. The sexiest woman in any room is not the one with the shortest skirt or the most cleavage or the longest hair. It's not. It is the woman who knows who she is. That That's what sexy is. That is what we are all attracted to, right? I mean, you will never hear a woman be like, oh my God, he is so hot and insecure. <laughs> like his insecurity, like, oh my God, it's amazing. <laughs> Like, never would you hear a woman say that. Ever. That's really funny. We're not attracted to insecurity. We're attracted to confidence. And so it doesn't, I say this to women all the time, like, it doesn't matter what size you are. If, if your outward looks are not important to you, cool. Like, if you think you're most beautiful in your Birkenstocks and, like, whatever, and your dreadlocks, like, cool, awesome, you know? Um, it's just about finding what makes you groove. And and most people will tell you, you are your sexiest when you're doing what you love, right? Like that is where you're fulfilling your passion in life is when you light up. And that's what we're attracted to. And that's what happens in pole class. You light up. And that's the magic of it, right? Um, I wish, I always like to say, if I could give everyone this like one vibrator, I, every woman in America, this one vibrator I love, one boudoir photo shoot and pole dancing classes. Like if I were Oprah, like I wouldn't give everyone a car. Like I would give everyone like those three things, every woman, because that is the magic mix, yes. I think. And it's the gift that keeps really giving. Do. It's like teach a man to fish or yes. whatever that phrase is, you know, because yes. it's so true. Yes. Can... He eats for a day yes. versus eats yes, for a long yes. time. Yeah. I love that. 100%. I love that. And and similar to what you're saying, and I love how supportive of other women you are. I think we just need more and more and more of that because I'm such a girl's girl. And I love that your 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 brand is Flirty Girl Guide. And um, I, I just, I love what you're doing. And, and for me too, in pole dancing class, you know, we have, there's no lights. There's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not pitch black, but it's very dimly lit and there's no mirrors. And it's all about us witnessing each other and cheering each other on. So like while one girl is dancing, one woman is dancing and doing her dance, some women are dancing in the background, but most of us are sitting on the floor, like cheering and going, ah, oh, sexy, hot, you know, and it's, that feels so good to be witnessed and held by other women in that and supported in your sexuality and like championed in your sexuality. Like, go get it, get that orgasm, get that, you know, like. Yeah. And I think it's so sad. Um, I talk about this a lot that we are our own worst enemies. Not that we orgasm in class, by the way, just, just, I mean, it, it's, I'm sure we come close a few times. I just wanted to clarify that for our listeners. Like I'm saying in reference to what you're doing as championing. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I also just wanted to get that out. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry about that. You know, the thing is, is that what you're doing in those moments is you are killing the mean old bitch in that woman's head, right? 
There is a mean old bitch that lives inside of us that says we're not good enough, we're not thin enough, we're not beautiful enough, and we have horrible back fat, right? The truth is, is that men don't even know what back fat is. So like, we should just like remove that concept from our lives. And women are the best way. It's not men who silence that. I mean, the reality is most men love the way we look. I mean, when we show up naked or in lingerie oh, for a man, it's over. Biologically, <laughs> yeah. what happens yeah. is that the Snapchat or Instagram filter with like the little like with the stars that like come down <laughs> yeah. like, that are like instant Botox, like that is what happens to a man's vision when we show up naked or in lingerie. So no matter what size you are, if you have your C-section scar that you hate, if your boobs are saggy, if you have the back fat, they don't see it. They see a gorgeous woman with vagina and boobs that he's about to play with and he is psyched. So it's us who think we're not beautiful enough or sexy enough or whatever. And that sucks. And so what's beautiful about S Factor, what's beautiful about um, what I do and what I see other moms doing for each other is, oh my God, you look amazing. Oh my God. Like you're so sexy. Like, look at you, you know? And, um, and we need to be doing that because we need to start silencing that woman in our head. She's such a bitch. And I, fucking hate her and I want her to die. She lives in my head too. You know, people have this misconception that I live this really sexy life and I have swings in my bedroom and I like wear latex masks and I like <laughs> think I'm the sexiest woman ever. I should be on a people cover, people magazine cover, or whatever. Which you should, no by the way. way. You like, should. No. Oh, well, goals, right? Hashtag goals. So, so, um, you know, I'm not, I'm just like everyone else, which is why in my brand, I really make a concerted effort to show me not beautiful and to show all the hard sides of my life and to, because I want women to understand I'm just like you. I am just like you. I am scared and sometimes things don't work for me and I suffer from depression and some days I hate my kids. Some days I love my kids and that's really confusing. And some days I think I look like the bomb and I'm hot as hell. And other days I just can't imagine going out in society because I just look so horrible. I mean, I'm living this life with all of us, like with all of you. and. We need to know that women need to know that they are part of a community and that they are not alone. You know, those women in us factor need to know that they can get up and do that because they're being validated by their sisters, right? We all need to know that um, because what women want is we want to be understood. That's all we want. Um, we want to be seen. And when we are brave enough to admit that this is hard, that we've lost our sexiness, that we don't want to have sex with our husbands anymore, that we're scared to try a toy, that we don't even have time to put lipstick on or have a date night because we can't afford a babysitter. Once we're honest about that, we can start changing it. Yeah, I love that. I want to talk to you a little bit about the depression. That's something that you and I share in common is the, um, I mean, I had depression before I had kids and was treated before, but our kids, I have one child <laughs> before I had my child. Can you talk a little bit about your postpartum depression and what that was like and how you got ended up getting through it? Did you seek treatment? Like what what did that look like for you like starting with your first child? I had postpartum anxiety, which is a strain of um maternal mental health that doesn't get a lot of publicity, but I had that with my daughter diagnosed in retrospect, right? Like I didn't know that that's what was happening at the time and never got help for it, but I suffered a lot. Um, I would get paralyzed. I wouldn't be able to like move. I remember there was one day I was driving with her. I had triggers, you know, there were certain triggers in my, like the crying and sleep, like lack, like that she wouldn't sleep when I wanted her to sleep um, were huge triggers for me. And I remember one day I pulled, I was driving and I just, I was going to a town to like walk her around. I live in a fairly bucolic area that doesn't have sidewalks. So, um, I was driving to a town and she was screaming and I, 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 I started shaking and I, I couldn't, I couldn't drive. I knew it was on, I knew enough that I was unsafe to drive. So I pulled the car over and I was hysterically crying and this kind woman pulled over 
and said, you know, are you, are you okay? Is your tire flat or your car not working? And I said, I don't know where I am. I don't know where I'm going. And she let me in and my daughter get in her car and she drove us home. And I don't know why that wasn't the signal that like I should go get help. But so there was that. And then when my son came along, you know, when you suffer um, in a prior um, pregnancy, you're more, very, much more likely to have it in a secondary. So there was like some prophylactic treatment that I did and therapy um, when my son came along or when I was pregnant with my son. Um, I knew the day that he was laid in my arms uh, that I was in trouble. I knew it. I, just to be clear, I did not have the type of postpartum issues where I was detached from my children. I was almost overly de- attached where I wouldn't let someone else help. I, I was terrified to let go of them, um, all of those things. And by the time he was, and, and the added pressure of having a second child. Now, like your son, I'm an only child also. I didn't know how to manage that. And I just got completely crushed and, um, I became suicidal and I didn't tell anyone. I don't know why I didn't tell anyone. I knew exactly how I was going to kill myself. I was going to run my car into a tree, not with my children in it. You know, I was only going to do it when my husband was home, who was a great dad. Um, And I felt like he was a better dad than I was a mom. And my friends, I had one day where it it just all fell apart. And I, I dropped my daughter off at preschool and I had my son in the car. Again, he was crying couldn't drive. My dad came to pick me up. They live nearby. I got back to his house. I started throwing up like crazy and like shaking on the floor. And he called my best friend and he and my best friend called my husband and called my doctor. And that was the day that I started to get better. I, I, I had a friend who said to me, today is the last day that it will be this bad. Today is the last day because from here it's going to get better. And it did, but it was a really slow road. And unlike you, I was not diagnosed with depression prior to having children. I thought my life was awesome. You know, the women who are most prone to getting PPD are the type A overachievers, right? Um, who I, I kicked but in my job, I had this like very Carrie Bradshaw life with like in the West Village in New York City. And I worked in magazines and I was like, you know, that cute girl with like my hand up getting a taxi with like some crinoline skirt with like Jimmy Choo's on, you know, like I knew what restaurants to go to and I killed it. I never got it. I got every job I went for. I got, you know, every promotion, blah, blah, blah. And suddenly I had these children that I didn't know what the heck to do. And I, it was that feeling of fear and failure that I'd never felt in my life that, you know, really plunged me over the edge. And in my recovery, which involved a psychiatrist who specializes in mothering issues, right? She's a sort of a PPD specialist um, and Zoloft, lots of Zoloft. I started to creep out of the hole. But what became apparent was that there had always been a hole and that I had depression and I didn't know it and that it wasn't going to stop. And I think there's this debate out there. Does postpartum depression ever end? You know, does it ever stop? I think the answer might be no. I'm not sure. It hasn't for me, you know, and I, um, and so I actually found out I was bipolar. Um, and so now I take medication for that, which really helps. It's been a lot. I, I am very in touch with my mental health because of my PPD, you know, and I do say I'm a survivor because I was going to die. There's no question in my mind I was going to die. And at your own hand, you feel, because you were having the suicidal ideation. That's so which real. You, which you, I had no idea who I was. Like, who is that that would do that? Like, I love living life. Like, I'm a vibrant person. And so... But mental illness does that. It just takes that away and reshapes it. I've experienced that too, where it's like, there is that logical thing. Like you were saying, you're thinking, oh, well, my husband's a better father I'm, than I am a mother. And the, you know, the kids will be better off without me. Those are real thoughts. It's not, it, they're just as logical as I'm going to the grocery store for milk now. Like they're, that's how it does it. It reframes it so that it's just. In your head, it makes sense. And I know yes. in those moments, all I wanted was for it to end. I just wanted it to go dark. You know, I would sit in a closet that was dark because I just, I couldn't face it. I just wanted it all to go away. And I didn't know how else to do that. 
Um, and I'm so thankful to the universe that that didn't happen in my support system. But a lot of women don't get that. And it makes me really sad. And I do talk about my PPD very openly because I try as hard as I can to take the shame away. Look, I'm trying to take the shame away from sex. I'm trying to take the shame away from maternal mental illness. Um, there's a lot in this world that we don't talk about and we're just harming moms in the process. We're really killing moms in the process is what we're doing. And I, I'm committed in my life to stop that. And Flirty Girl was a way to do that. You know, I, look, I spent, it occurred to me one day in therapy, um, once I had started this business, it's three years old. And it occurred to me, oh my Lord, I created a business that literally has no place for children. I created something for myself that I could never involve my children in. It is mine alone as a woman. And I thought that is significant. I really need that. I'm a, I'm a mom who needs that. Um, and it's interesting that I subconsciously did that. Uh, I think it's interesting at least. Um, and so, yeah, I, I still deal with depression. I go to therapy, you know, every week. I struggle with it a lot. Um, I'm very honest about it. But doing this and helping other women and tapping into that sexier side of myself, it is therapy. It is medication for me. I don't think I would be here without it. Yeah, I love that. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that because I, I share that with you. You know, obviously our experiences are different, but my feeling and my takeaway from it now, um, still being in recovery from it, still on Prozac, still in my therapy, my therapist's office once a week, is again, the more that we talk about it and the more that we share our experience, um, it does chip away at the shame because when we don't talk about something or when we shush it or, you know, that creates shame. And I think same for, you know, our kids see us doing that. Like if we don't talk about something, I'll take an example. So like, you know, children that are special needs or whatever, special needs, special rights. So um, I have one of those. Disabled. So I, my son has okay. Asperger's. So, okay. Yeah. I, so naming it is so important for like with my child always from the time he was little, you know, he would say, what's, what's that, you know? Well, that person has a wheelchair because you know that's that, that means they have a disability and always talk about it. And so now it's not even a thing. I mean, he he's known what homosexuality is from the time he could talk. And so it's not even a thing for him. It's just it is a fact. And there's no shame, there's no secrecy. So tell me about your son. I want yeah, to about so this. so my son, um, my daughter is the older one, she is neurotypical. Um and my son has Asperger's. And for people who don't know what that is, officially it's a form of autism, um, but it's very high functioning. It, it, you know, a lot of like your smartest people in the world, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, like they all have Asperger's, right? Your brain is extremely cognitively high, but you might suffer from some like social awkwardness kind of thing. Um, thank goodness now in the world, we have what's called early intervention. So if you can identify it early, you can start sort of social therapies that make children, you know, function much more, um, normally amongst peers. Right. So my son was identified at three, but we knew at like, I knew it too, that something was awry, like nursery school wasn't going well. And the thing is, is a lot of, um, Asperger's, children and, and adults and autistic adults, they're wallflowers, right? Like they don't like to communicate and they don't like to be around people. My son was the opposite. Like he's a chatterbox and he loves people and he loves kids and he's so mushy and lovey. And so it was confusing to diagnose him, but he was identified at three. And thankfully we were under amazing care. We live in a state and a county that provides amazing services and he, I'm so proud of this kid. He is in general population mainstream kindergarten this year. And I can't believe I'm actually saying this for the first time without crying because normally I cry. Mm. Um, it's okay if you do. Yeah, the, the day, the day that you get that I got, I won't speak for anyone else. The diagnosis in the room with him that he had Asperger's, which is autism. 
this is like taking a bullet, right? Because there is a stereotype to that and there is a shame and it's devastating because I realize this is forever. This is not a sickness or problem that we can heal. Like this is forever. And that's, that's what is hard. Um, but, and it's a daily thing and I do every amount of parent training I can do, but it's a family wide effort. Look, it's really hard for my daughter to have a brother with special needs who needs attention. It, that's really hard. I feel for her all the time. Um, it's forced our family to parent differently, to parent, you know, to do things. And it, it, look, there are days where that doesn't work. And there's, it's just, and I feel for him. It breaks my heart, but it's given me so much empathy not just for moms of special needs, but for the world, really. And, you know, we don't know what anyone's going through. We, we should never judge a book by its cover. And it's so interesting. So, so much of my insecurity and my depression and my um, bipolar and all of these things is connected to motherhood and my, um, my issues with that, whether I'm doing a good enough job and feeling like a failure, that's all tied to motherhood. But having a special needs son interestingly has made me feel like the best mom I could ever be because I fight for this child. I fight for my other child because I know she feels neglected sometimes. It has forced me to be, maybe not forced me, but I feel like there is no one that could be a better mom to these kids. And so that's been very empowering, helpful. I mean, there's still plenty of days where I think I'm the worst, but, um, and the other thing about my son is so he has a Hebrew name as his main name, and it means gift. And I didn't know it when I named him this, but he, and this is where I cry, um, he is the biggest gift to our family. I actually hope my daughter never hears this. <laughs> he has been gift to our family and to me because I know my business with this flirty girl business that l- fills me up so much would never have happened without him. Um, and the postpartum that I went through because of him, his Asperger's is such a gift because of that empathy. And, um, he's just the love that I've had to grow. Um, he has been such a gift and I think it's the universe maybe meant something in us choosing that name for him. That's, been my experience with a special needs kid and just like my PPD and my sexuality and all those things I I talk about it really openly because there is so much shame and you know one of the things that people have said to me I'm not saying this from a place of you know arrogance or bragging but they call me brave Brooke you're so brave like what you do is really brave you know flirty girl that's so brave I don't know if I see myself as brave I see myself as honest And I see myself as kind of not caring what other people think. And so I say all the things that we might all have in our heads, but maybe we're not comfortable enough to say it out loud. I don't think it's a brave, not brave thing. I think it's a comfort thing. And so if I can be the voice for the moms who can't, for whatever reason, that's that's how I see my role on this planet. That's what I was here to do is to give voice to a generation of moms who, who have lost it or are scared to use it. I don't see the work that I do as sex. I, I see the work that I do is, is about moms and saving them and making their lives better. I do not care even two crafts, how many sex toys I sell. I don't, I, this is not why I got into this business. What fills me up is when I have a mom, you know, direct message me on Instagram saying, oh my God, you you just explained my life. Thank you. Um, That's what fills me up. Or if they did buy a toy, I just had the best date night with my husband ever. We feel so connected. I can't thank you enough. My husband likes to joke that he hates Sunday mornings because my phone tends to blow up. The problem with my business <laughs> is that, and because I care so much, it's like I make friends with, like every client becomes, or follower becomes like my friend. I become yeah. so invested yeah. in their lives. And so they all Aww. will text me. I get like, my phone blows up on Sunday morning because usually date night will happen on Saturday nights, right? For sure. a lot of people. Yeah. And so I get these messages. That was the best day ever. He loved my piece of lingerie. Like I orgasmed four Aww. times or like whatever. And um, 
that's why I do this. Yay. That's the job. That's the, that's the payoff. That's why I'm here. Um, and I'm proud. I'm proud yeah. to do that. And I know when my daughter gets old enough to know, like really know what I do, yeah. I hope she's proud of me. I really do. I hope I'm paving some kind of way for her to be more, to have more than one identity. You know, I yes. say this a lot. We literally trade our name in when we have a child. We are no longer Brooke, Jennifer, you know, Sandy. We become, you know, Hudson's mom, Avery's yeah, mom, exactly. right? Like yeah. we, our husbands, our partners start calling like, like, mommy, did you do bedtime? It's like, yeah. we don't even have our names anymore. That's just such a mind fuck. Like it really is this massive mind fuck. And I just don't know who decided that we had to give up our, uh, our identity to become a mother. Like it's a, it's total crap and it's not serving anybody. Like the reason that mommy problems and jokes and mommy humor is so a part of the cultural zeitgeist right now is because we're dying. Like we're all just dying inside. And the only way to make it better is to laugh. Right. And to try to find other people to laugh about it. So, you know, everyone's sort of moving in the direction of unmasking the identity loss and, and how hard this is. I just am doing it in the context of sex. That's what I do. I love it. I love it. Oh my God, Brooke, you're so amazing. You. I'm, I'm, I'm sad that you're on the other side of the country because I want to go out to dinner. With well, you. girl, let me like, tell talk. you something. I go to LA all the time for work. Yes. So I will be there in January. You and I are going to meet up. It's I would love to do yes, an S factor class together. I think that would be All amazing. Let's take yes. it. I think it would be fabulous. And this is what I'm telling you, like it's, you were Insta friends. We just have to be. Yes. <laughs> it's the only yes. way we do this. So oh, yes, anytime I'm it. in LA, we're hanging girl. We are hanging. Please let me know. And we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Up. Yes, for sure. Pole dancing. And I all. mean, so, I have my pole um, shoes. I love those. Yes, girl. Yes. Oh, I have probably eight pair. Are yours super comfortable? Yeah. That padding is amazing. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. It's like, yeah, it's funny because you at first you think, how am I going to walk in this? And then so you learn to walk. They're actually because of the platform, yeah. it's it's more comfortable than any other normal high heel shoe. I, yeah, I love and it. There's like this weird padding that happens in there. I have this other yes. idea that I need to go to Italy and like design Manolo Blahnik slash you know Jimmy Choo shoes that have that in it. Because wouldn't it change the world? It would. I know because I don't wear my Jimmy Choo's. I have a pair of beautiful gray patent leather Jimmy Choo's, and they're so they're hard. Sorry, Jimmy. They're, I know. they're really not. Comfortable well, you can wear them in bed. You can wear you them can in wear bed them lying and you can down. wear them like in an Uber and and sitting at dinner. Yeah. They're not walking shoes. Yeah. No, girl. That's why everyone in New York wears flip-flops until they get to the office and then they put their totally. shoes on. <laughs> Birkenstock. Yes. Yeah. So Brooke, we've come to the time where I'm going to ask you the three questions I ask every guest and then um, we'll go into the lightning round. Are you I'm ready? I'm totally ready. What do you think about Brooke when you hear the word MILF? Moms, I'd like to fuck, and I swear to God, I hope I'm one of them. You are. <laughs> you are. You know you are, babe. <laughs> I mean, uh, what's something you've changed your mind about recently? Butt sex. Ooh. Okay, <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> yes. Nice. Yeah. How do you define success? When your soul feels like it's doing its right work. Hmm. And you certainly sound like you're aligned with what you're doing on all levels. Just so beautiful to witness. All right, girl, lightning round. Ocean or desert? Ocean. Favorite junk food? Tortilla chips, Doritos, something like that. Oh, yes. Movies or Broadway show? Movies. Daytime sex or nighttime sex? Nighttime sex. Texting or talking? Sadly, texting. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I know. Cat person or dog person? Dog person, even though I have a cat. Have you ever worn a unitard? Yeah. It's fishnet, but yeah. Yes. Now, does it have an opening in the crotch? Of course. <laughs> okay, just checking. Yeah. 
shower or bathtub? Shower at home, bathtub in really good hotels. Oh, yes. Oh, that's such a good answer. Ice cream or chocolate? Oh, ice cream. On a scale of one to 10, how good are you at ping pong? Weirdly, a nine. Ooh. Yeah. That's very yeah. sexy. Even the way you just said it is sexy. Who thought ping pong could be sexy, but it is. I mean, I can make, um, I'm the friend that can make anything sex, like turn anything well, especially, into sex. I just got the visual of you in a fishnet onesie. I uh, mean, a fishnet crotchless onesie playing ping pong. I think that's a photo shoot. I, I mean, think that's right? some kind of branding photo shoot. <laughs> There's something that needs to happen, some magic that needs to happen with that. Uh, what is your biggest pet peeve? Double negatives. Oh, if you could push a button and have perfect skin for the rest of your life, but it would also give you incurable halitosis for the rest of your life, would you push it? No. Superpower choice, invisibility or ability to fly? Invisibility. Would you rather have a penis where your tailbone is or a third eye? Penis where a tailbone is. That would make three sounds amazing. <laughs> oh my God, I love you. What was the name of your first pet? Natasha. What was the name of the street you grew up on? McQueen, which is my porn name, right? Oh Natasha God. McQueen, which I yes. dare, I dare anyone to beat that. That's pretty badass. I dare you to beat that. Natasha McQueen? Yeah. Wearing a fishnet onesie playing ping pong? I think we just nailed it. I mean, <laughs> what more is there <laughs> out of life? On the ping pong table. <laughs> really? Oh my gosh. So Brooke, where can we, uh, our listeners, find your website and your Instagram? Like, where can we find you? Yeah. So I am mostly Instagram based. I am at flirty girl guide. Um, you'll see like a black and white picture of me where I'm not looking homeless. Um, so that's where you can <laughs> find me. Um, and then my website is flirtygirlguide, all one word, dot com. The best way that I can talk to women about toys and recommendations and all of that great stuff is to email me at brooke with an E at flirtygirlguide.com or just direct message me on Instagram. Um, and we'll instantly become best friends because we'll talk about your clip and then <laughs> we'll get you the best options for like five orgasms in five minutes. Yeah. That should be like my, like some kind of show or like something, five orgasms in five minutes. Oh, yeah. I've got it. We've got it. That's something. I yes, that is, that, that is a thing. That's a great <laughs> title. Yeah. For all my listeners, we will have um, on the show notes on my website, there's always links to all of that. So if you're listening and you're driving and you can't write it down, you can go to milfpodcast.com and you it will always be there where you can find Brooke and all her goodies and all her suggestions and way to contact her and talk to her about all these things. Brooke, you are such a delight. This was amazing. I'm so honored to know you. Thank you. And thank you for being a part of the show. Thank you. I can't. I'm so excited. You're, I love what you're doing. I loved the turning the MILF on its head. I think it's empowering and feminist and wonderful. And I can't wait to attack that poll with you, girl. Yeah, we're going to do it. <laughs> we're going to do it. Thank you so much. Brooke. Thank you, Mama. Thanks so much for listening, guys. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Brooke. Next week on the show, we have actress Ioni Skye who you might remember from movies like Say Anything, The Rachel Papers, The Color of Evening, just to name a few of my favorites. Um, oh, Gas Food Lodging, remember that? And so many other credits between then and now. She is just really constantly working. And her new show on HBO called Camping, which I'm so excited to share about. So go ahead and check out our show notes for today on milfpodcast.com. You can also find us on Instagram, uh, Facebook, all the things. Links to that are all on my website. And um, I'm really just so grateful to you guys for tuning in. And I'll talk to you next week. Thanks. Thanks.